Hi everyone, welcome to uh, Everyday Analysis, um, either our first or second episodes uh, on, on Sublation Media. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, just a few things before we jump into it. We've got a really exciting episode today where we're going to talk about questions of sexuality, trauma, consent, uh, based on a really interesting new book. Um, but before we start, just a quick mention of a couple of things. Um, for the patrons, and the patron uh, link is just below here, uh, we're now also doing like a monthly uh, reading group where we look at key psychoanalytic texts uh, or... Um, texts sometimes from Marxism or other kinds of critical theory but with some kind of psychoanalytic orientation uh, and we actually are distributing the readings to everyone and meeting up on Zoom uh, and actually doing a kind of close reading together of key psychoanalytic texts so if people are interested in getting involved with that um, you can click through the, the the Patreon link below it's also free it's actually free to sign up um, uh, it's just uh, hosted there um, so um, please uh, please do check that out as well and um, yeah, I hope you're enjoying this new series of interviews that I'm doing um, on Sublation. And today, really happy to be joined um, by Avge Sakatopoulou. Hope I'm saying that right. Yes. Um, close enough, maybe. Um, who's written a fascinating new book, which is really just out, isn't it? When did it come out, um, Avge? Uh, it, um, it was released on the 7th of February, so just last week. So just a week ago, and um, yeah, the book is called Sexuality Beyond Consent. Thanks so much for joining us, and I'm really looking forward to asking you some questions about this really brilliant book. Terrific. Thank you so much for, for inviting me. I'm really excited to dive in. I really want to get into some of the, the, the questions of trauma and some of the examples that you give of extremely interesting encounters that you've had with um, analyzans or, 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 or examples that you give. Um, but before we, before we do that, I wanted to ask you about the... Um, question of La Planche, right? Because, um, you know, I've been doing this interview series, or I did a previous one of around 30 interviews, almost all of them were with Lacanian uh, mm -hmm. sci-fi. And we were really, I was really looking to, to branch out of that and talk to um, people influenced by different um, critical thinkers through the history of psychoanalysis, right? But I haven't yet uh, interviewed or spoken to anyone uh, working through La Planche. I know, um, I really, I, I, I only know the famous La Planche and Pontalis, you know, dictionary of psychoanalytic terms that I'm sure, it's called the language of psychoanalysis, isn't it? That, yeah. that was a book that was extremely uh, useful to me as a student of psychoanalysis, but I still go to it all the time and I find it's really, really useful. So I've sort of always known of La Planche through this, um, but this is the first time I've read a, a book that really sort of argues that La Planche has lots to add to critical debates around psychoanalysis when it comes to these topics. I wonder if you might want to start by just saying what it is that makes La Planche really important to you and what you wanted to kind of do with it. Yeah, that's terrific. Thank you. In, in some ways, I would say even if you have not studied La Planche, if you've been working with a dictionary, you're all already kind of like you already have your mind dipped in the pool uh, and perhaps more refracted through La Planche than you may even realize. Um, so La Planche brings to psychoanalytic thinking a very particular kind of sensibility, which I think is unique to him because he says several things. He understands himself as starting from Freud and actually realigning Freud with a Freudian method um, where he feels Freud went astray. And maybe we'll talk a little bit about that more specifically, like the, the, the main... Um, the main points where he feels Freud went astray was in the abandonment of the seduction theory, or what he calls the so-called abandonment, because he believes that even though Freud kind of like makes this kind of like very dramatic announcement to flee, saying kind of like, I'm, I'm kind of like basically done with my neurotica, I have to withdraw that hypothesis. And like the question of seduction circles Freud and circles his, his work for the rest of his career. The other place where Laplanche kind of like makes his intervention is to talk a little bit about how Freud starts out with a theory of sexuality that is actually through the infantile sexual quite expansive and quite um, kind of like dashingly both brilliant and provocative. But in the course of his work begins to pull back. And by the time he comes up first in um, the 1910 revision of the three essays, especially in Schreber and kind of like really it comes to be in the paper on narcissism, Freud starts offering a theory of narcissism that turns Eros into something much more domesticated and much more um, 
about binding and connection and whole object functioning, which completely misses um, the aspects of the infantile sexual that have to do with the more destructive, destabilizing properties of the sexual, which to begin with, in the infantile sexual that Freud posited in the three essays, was very much part of the erotic, uh, not as deviation, um, not as a, uh, not as a kind of like a, a, a an erotic that has gone wrong, but actually the very ontology of the erotic has these elements in it. So Laplanche notices this and kind of like tracks it quite obsessionally in his own writings, and comes up with a very interesting idea, which is that he says, well. By the time Freud cleans up the sexual this way and Eros becomes more about, by the time he gets to the second topography and Eros becomes more about binding and connection, he's completely lost his tether in kind of like the more kind of like polymorphously perverse elements of the sexual. So there goes sadomasochism, there goes any affinity that the erotic has with objection, with shame, um, so if he produces a much more cleaned up version of the erotic, now he has a problem, Laplanche says. What's the problem? The problem is what's he going to do with everything else? So Laplanche theorizes Freud ends up having to posit the notion of the death instinct because he needs a place to house all of these things that he has basically ousted out of the erotic when he has turned the infantile sexual into just the force of errors and binding. And that creates tremendous problems for Freud because, you know, he spends the rest of his life then, now that he's taken them apart, trying to kind of like theorize how do the two come together? He has various ideas about that, like innate destructiveness or trauma. Um, Laplanche does not do that. Laplanche says, let's go back to where kind of like the infantile sexual has both the, the, the binding forces of errors, but also the more... Um, destabilizing forces of errors. And let's take that as the starting point of the erotic. Um, and that permits him to do very different things with, with the sexual drive than, than Freud does, which for him is also not biological. That's the other major intervention that he makes. So Laplanche gives us a way to come back to the drive, having cleaned it out from the notion that um, the sexual drive is biological. And he gives us a sexual drive that is intersubjectal, uh, to use a word by Dominique Scarfoni, which is not the same thing as intersubjective. It has something to do with the encounter between the, the adult and the child, but it's not about, it's, it doesn't happen on the level of subjectivity. So you end up with a sexual drive that is actually much more capacious and much more exciting than the ways in which biology bogs down Freud's of the sexual, Freud's notion of the sexual. I mean, I'm tempted to yeah, I come back to the question of this kind of perverse um, nature of all sexuality, because one of the chapters uh, you, you you talk about this question of saying that sexuality is perverse as such, rather than perversion is when sexuality goes wrong, as you've just kind of touched on. But just first of all, to, 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 to pick up on what you said about this interaction between parent and children, I think this is really interesting. One of the really fascinating examples you give in the book of something like this is um, when like a father is changing the nappy of mm -hmm. the child and they are cleaning the, uh, the 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 genital area or whatever and when they come to the anus they pr apply less pressure than they would do with the legs or something or whatever and this is kind of conscious on the part of the, it's, it's kind of it could be unconscious on the part of the father or whatever but it sends a kind of message to the infant that there is something happening there and this is how like <laughs> the infantile starts to play a critical role in understanding the sexuality and what they are. So I don't know, maybe you could uh, unpack that example a bit, or am I right that this is a, a, a an example of what you just described of how we need to think of sexuality as, yeah, in, including the infantile rather than something yeah. that starts. Yeah. I, I think this is a, a very good place to start. So he, the example that I use in the book is of a father who's changing his, his son's diaper. Um, and, you know, really for Laplanche, it doesn't matter. The gender of the parent does not matter. Uh, that the biological tie, whether it's an adopted child, whether like there's kind of like it's a, kind of like queer kinship is kind of like very um, um, compatible with uh, the ways in which Laplanche talks about this. Asymmetry is basically what matters in the relationship between the adult and the child. So you have a caretaker, let's say um, a man who's taking care of a child. Um, and he is changing his diaper 
And as he's kind of like cleaning him and taking care of him, he applies a little bit less pressure around the anus. Now, we can imagine many reasons why that may happening could be happening, right? It could be, let's say, the incest prohibition. Let's say it's homoerotic anxiety. The truth is we don't know. Um, it, it's also true, and this is very critical to Laplanche, that even if the father is thinking, you know what, like, I don't want to hurt him or like, let me not touch his butt too much. Whatever the father is thinking consciously, even if the father is, say, a very well analyzed individual and is very aware of his conflicts around the incest prohibition or homoerotic anxiety, the thing is, Laplanche says, there will always be something more, something extra and excess in addition to whatever the parent may be aware of, but also in addition to whatever may be happening that the parent may not be aware of, but is still operative at that site. So the infant, on the other hand, has no idea about any of this. What the infant senses is basically a difference, a difference of pressure. That's it. And it's felt on a very embodied level. If, if we can imagine that that scene of diapering happens again and again and again, it, it's, it begins, the infant begins to note, like it becomes noticeable, not on the level of cognition, but on the level of embodied experience, that something different is happening around his anus. So now, kind of like this, this kind of like something different, this surcharge, Laplanche says, that alongside the message of, let me take care of you, oh, you're like, give me a second, you're going to be comfortable in a moment, whatever the father enunciates um, or, or intends towards the baby, uh, consciously or not, there's always a surcharge, which Laplanche calls noise. Um, there's a noise on the communication. The infant senses that noise through that difference of um, tactile contact. In this particular example, the pressure. And this is how the father's kind of like enigmatic surplus of the message, in addition to what is intended, that surplus gets, Laplanche says, implanted on the child's psychophysiological skin. And that is what Laplanche calls enigmatic. And it's very important to underscore that for Laplanche, enigmatic is not. It's not enigmatic because the infant is yet undeveloped and he can't really understand what's going on and it's either too young and maybe later they will be able to like piece it together. No, Laplanche says it's enigmatic by virtue of the fact that that communication is disrupted by the noise. So that, what exactly was happening at that moment will, will never be able to be interpreted. All that the infant can do is code it with meaning. And here is one of kind of like the more fascinating aspects of Laplanchian theory, which is the following. So the infant kind of like is now stuck with this kind of like enigmatic transfer, which Laplanche calls, uh, he describes it as a thorn on the side of the ego. Something is kind of like implanted, but not, but what's implanted is a void. What's implanted is not a message that can be recovered. And the infant will try to make sense of it. And that process of how the infant makes sense of it, which Laplanche called translation, is an extremely interesting aspect, which brings us to how to think about the social. And in the book, I do a lot of that around race. Um, mm -hmm. And we can talk about that more. But the thing is that whatever the infant does, there's always going to be a residue and something that kind of like falls off and is not able to be coded with meaning. That part gets repressed and becomes what... Laplanche describes as the sexual unconscious. So the sexual unconscious in Laplanche originates through the other's intervention in this way, rather than being kind of like the kind of like being activated, so to speak, uh, in the interpersonal encounter, but really being um, inherited or part of our instinctual uh, repertoire. Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating. Uh, and and I just, yeah, I, I think it's extremely interesting. And one of the things I want to ask is how does this connect to uh, what you somewhere call a theory of perversity, right? Mm -hmm. Because it occurs to me that there in the book, you also say that, um, well, again, this is something, um, well, it is fascinating in its own right. You, you'd start with this story about a uh, a, a, a client, or I can't remember where the story comes from now, who uh, goes to like a bathhouse uh, with uh, his lover, and oh. you, see this, um, you see this disgusting old ugly man who's like abject, um, and the um, the lover 
finds it so revolting she decides to leave and at first he thinks of, of leaving also um, but then in the end he realizes that along with this repulsion is also attraction and he proceeds to sort of have a sexual encounter which is very uh, orgasmic or whatever with this so-called ugly repulsive being and through this you introduce the concept of perversity which I was just thinking about when you were speaking there because somewhere in the book you say that um, for you perversion is uh, something that has to do with the materiality of the body, right? Mm -hmm. um, which uh, and and also which involves. Oh, here it is. Here, here it is. Um, the, the, I use the term perversion to designate polymorphous sexual processes rather than circumscribed sex acts that issue from the materiality of the body, which involve internal experience and which engage rather than resist the exigent forces of the infantile sexual. Mm -hmm. So, in a, what you were just talking about, the infantile sexual, and also the materiality of the body, very present in that story with the the diaper, um, are part are part of the perverse nature of sexuality. Would that be right? Yes, uh, with one small edit, which is that you know when you were saying earlier that this so this man goes in there with his uh, with his um, lover and his his partner leaves because he finds the situation very disgusting. My patient who stays behind is not finding himself attracted to the stranger. This is the kind of like the strangeness of the infantile sexual. It cannot actually be broken down to attraction or connection or a bond. In other words, we're not in the domain of eros in the Freudian sense of the word. We are in the domain of the infantile sexual in the enlarged sense of the world. So there is um, kind of like this, there's something so abject about the stranger that this individual cannot turn away from. And what he finds is that in trying to, that gap between what he thought he would be into and the desire that, as he says, is opening up in his body, is something that he decides to, <clears throat> excuse me, to throw himself in as opposed to resist like his, like his uh, lover who left the room because he was feeling disgusted. Mm -hmm. So there's something about this encounter, this brushing up against this, what uh, kind of like what I, I also describe in the book kind of like the more opaque parts of the self that are not about trying to understand them or kind of like after the fact delineate where they're coming from or where they're connected from, but that too, but that there's always something in the self that is opaque. And this engagement with opacity is part of what I argue throughout the book also requires one to, to bend one's will to be able to engage with something strange and unusual in oneself. And that can be, this is kind of like where aesthetic and erotic experience kind of like begin to play a very big role in the book. So, so what, what would, what in a, in a nutshell is your primary sort of argument when it comes to um, this question of perversion? You know, we, we need to um, move away from seeing perversion as uh, something when something goes wrong uh, mm -hmm. and see it as something which is built into sexuality from the infantile experience onwards going uh, forward? I, I would like to break this question into two questions. Uh, the one is, how do we think of it conceptually? And the other is, how do we relate to it as human beings? Yeah. Uh, and I think the latter is a, is a short, has a shorter answer, which is that these are, because I'm working very much with the philosophy of Georges Bataille um, in this book, I'm also very committed to, these are not projects, these are not things that one sets out sets out to do like you know if if you're on the sling and kind of like this kind of like object stranger walks into the room you actually don't know ahead of time nor can you plan whether you will engage with him this way or not i mean you can plan for it and you can kind of like keep yourself in the room and have kind of like sex with an object stranger in this kind of scenario but those are not the kinds of experiences that I'm talking about of kind of like a willfulness and exercising one's will in order to try to get an experience. In fact, the exercise of the will does not usually deliver us to these kinds of experiences. It's more the bending of our will and the bending of our resistances and pushing up against the ego that can open that up. So in terms of like kind of like how should we relate to perversion? Like I think that these are things that emerge as opposed to are pre-planned. Mm -hmm. But I am trying to make a very kind of like... Um, careful and deliberate argument about how we engage with it conceptually, which is that because of kind of like some of the ways in which Freud split up the sexual and the aggressive, which de-aggressivized sexuality, 
and desexualized aggressivity. Every time we encounter together kind of like the more the darker elements of the sexual, we feel like we need to account for them to understand where they're coming from. Like, so, you know, think about Kristeva, for example, like the thinking kind of like that there's something about objection that also has with the initial kind of like uh, separation from kind of like body fluids between child and mother, kind of like both the attraction to that site, but also that's the site of differentiation. This is an effort to take objection and kind of like narrate it, put it into a hermeneutic project. And part of what Laplanche gives us is a way of thinking about perversity, whether it manifests sexually or not, uh, but especially in the domain of, ero of the erotic, um, as, as an ontological condition that we resist as opposed to as something that needs to be explained and accounted for. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, no, it does. And, and it's extremely, I mean, it leads really nicely into what I wanted to talk about next, which was to talk about these terms, trauma, traumaphilia and traumaphobia, let's say. Mm -hmm. And um, and and um, I suppose in a sense, yeah, what we're dealing with here is, you just said, the way our culture wants to uh, explain and deal with perversity in a certain way when it might not always be. And you, you say a similar thing. I, I think your argument here is was slightly surprising to me and I found fascinating because your argument is that in a sense, we're actually a trauma, trauma, Am I saying traumaphobic or traumatophobic? A traumaphobic society, whereas I had always thought of it as, um, you know, we're obsessed as a, as a culture with um, trauma uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, and keep revisiting it. But of course, you're saying both these things and you're, you're, you're saying that what we, the reason why our culture is um, traumaphobic is because what it does is it goes um, back to trauma in, a, in an attempt to solve it, to, to, mm -hmm. to cleanse it, fix it. And exactly. there's this um, illusion that uh, traumas are in fact solved. And you, you know, you say that through your own clinical practice, for example, you've never seen a trauma solved. You know, this is not really how we relate to trauma. But we as a culture seem to have this obsession with, um, you know, going back to uh, things we perceive as traumatic and trying to solve them. On the other side, you introduce this concept, which comes from Laplanche, but not originally from Laplanche, if I'm if I'm right. Uh, trauma to traumatophilia, <laughs> yeah. which is um, a a more positive uh, retur returning to trauma, mm -hmm. to uh, think about how the subject relates to their trauma and works with it, um, mm -hmm. rather than cleansing it out and um, mm -hmm. purifying. So maybe you could talk about these two terms and and what you think's at stake in this kind of intervention yeah. about, about traumatophilia. Yeah, Th thank you for that. This is actually a very central argument in the book, and it is, as you say, uh, surprising to many people, especially because. Kind of like on surface, it looks like our cultures are very preoccupied with trauma. Um, but le let us also remember that our cultures are also very preoccupied with repairing trauma and healing trauma, uh, which is another way of putting it is that they are very interested in making trauma disappear. Um, now, I should say that I'm not talking here about the question of whether we should be worried about whether people get traumatized, of course, we should be worried about that, or whether kind of like social conditions or familial conditions create traumatic circumstances for some people. Obviously, I'm not saying, you know, anything. Let's 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 go with that. But I am saying that once trauma happens, the fantasy that it can be eliminated out of the psyche, psyche is is what I call traumatophobic, because, um, and in this I'm very influenced by Laplanche, but I'm also influenced by um, black feminisms, um, and I'll say how. Because Laplanche, for example, starts out with a notion that you're traumatized from the get-go. In fact, the very process of the other's um, intrusion into you is part of what sets in motion the process of our subjectivation and of our developing an unconscious. So if trauma is at the originary point of our becoming human. And humanity for Laplanche is not about organismic life, nor is it about the respect of rights or dignity. It's about the acquisition of a sexual unconscious. So if we become human by virtue of that trauma, then trauma is there from the beginning, not something that can be eliminated, but actually the, the engine and the motor, even as it may also be difficult and overwhelming and puts in motion mechanisms about protecting the ego against it. it it's, it's part of how, kind of, it's the spark that starts everything. And so this is a Laplanchian aspect of this. The, the, the work that I'm also doing in the book is very engaged with 
black feminisms and the ways in which um, uh, kind of like if, if you're thinking about black life, I'm working primarily in the US and with antebellum history, but I think this applies kind of like all over the world with different kinds of historical contexts. Um, the, the idea that kind of like a, a, a black person who is laboring under anti-black racism in the United States or who has been born into a history that they did not choose, but in the shadow of which they nevertheless have to live, the intergenerational transmission of history of slavery and, um, and um, kind of like racism, th these are never going to be repaired in the psyche of any one individual. In fact, individuals have to learn to live with them in the aftermath of trauma. So part of what I work towards in the book is also to show that this fantasy of healing or, of, or intact subjects or of unbroken subjects or even more so of unbreakable subjects is a white fantasy. It's the fantasy of the white psyche that there is a way to not have injury. Um, so if, if that is an unrealistic covenant, then the question becomes, so what do we do about trauma? And when I speak in terms of our metapsychology and conceptually about traumatophilia and traumatophobia, part of what I'm urging is for us to loosen our grasp on how tightly we are kind of like holding on to the idea of curing trauma and healing trauma and repairing trauma and become more interested in what individuals already do with their trauma. And in the clinic, when we see patients engage with their trauma, there's usually a kind of worry that the patient is too attached to it, the patient has not worked it through. This is where notions of repetition compulsion kind of like become kind of like very widely utilized. And, and as you were saying, even in culture, like you're saying, well, actually we're very involved with our trauma. And part of what I'm trying to say is yes, but not the way in which sometimes people try mm -hmm. to be involved with their trauma, not as a way of just repeating but also as a way of establishing a relationship with the trauma. So there is all of this conversation about, kind of like very colloquially, we talk about exercising our demons or kind of like putting our, definitely with Lowell's work on therapeutic action, the idea of like putting our ghosts to rest so that they become ancestral. But the truth is that that never happens. Like no ghosts go to bed and leave us alone trauma always kind of like flares up um, mm. and it flares up I think especially so in the domain of the erotic and the aesthetic where it gets engaged with with a, the kind of libidinal ferocity that can be scary especially to analysts especially to analysts who work with notions of emotional regulation or with notions of trying to uh, put ghosts to rest yeah, I mean, I was extremely interested. Really glad, glad that you. I was going to ask you how this plugs into to race, uh, which is another theme of your book, and you've already sort of get, got into that. But um, let me just first check. I'm sort of understanding this right, or maybe I'll try and oversimplify it, and you can correct me. Because um, when I was thinking about this traumatophilia, traumatophobia thing, I was wondering sort of. I mean, I so I had a very mild so-called traumatic experience in my childhood, a very very mild sort of encounter with a paedophile in my youth, and I never really thought anything of it. So I'm not. I'm not uh, treating you as my therapist here. I, <laughs> I'm just, um, I, I'm just wrenching it because uh, I never thought anything of it until I started, years later, I started, you know, everyone on Twitter started talking about their trauma. And it was only at this point that I started thinking, hang on, maybe I should also start thinking back. Right now, a lot of that I think is kind of nonsense. But now I'm wondering whether um, uh, cause what I would have thought there is this is a, a trauma failure. Like everyone is now currently obsessed with their trauma, mm -hmm. but in fact, what you are saying is that might be more like a trauma phobia because what it is, is it's looking for this kind of solution, which mm -hmm. is we'll go back to our traumas because we've got this impulse to fix what can't be fixed. Mm -hmm. is that, am I sort of correctly understanding that? Yeah, sort of like I'm, I'm thinking about what you're saying, kind of like, and, and Freud and Laplanche and Lacan, talk a lot about kind of like the, the upper core in, in some of the ways that you're also kind of like implicitly bringing up like this question of like something happens, it doesn't get registered as traumatic. Um, and then kind of like at a later time, there is a second event, which really is the first event because it's the event that causes you to go back and kind of like it, it activates something or excites something and excites does not in psychoanalytic language, as you know, does not necessarily mean 
it's not necessarily a good thing or a bad thing. It just it's about kind of like the energetic up, up surge of something that was kind of like dormant. Mm -hmm. And then in the aftermath of that experience, the, the original experience may become traumatic or it may become rewritten. And certainly this is something that Freud talked about and that very few psychoanalysts have stayed with and taken seriously. So that's that's the first thing that comes to mind in relation to the example that you're bringing up. And um, uh, would I, I mean, is this too much of an oversimplification that you're sort of saying that to relate to it traumatophilically is healthier than the traumatophobic approach, which if I've understood rightly, you're you're connecting to actually a kind of white thinking, actually, because it's well, the... Not, not in that way. No, I wouldn't say that a subject, like I wouldn't say that somebody in your position who is kind of like doing, like who is thinking now about what happened to them in their childhood is traumatophilic or traumatophobic. I would say, again, like this intervention is not about directing anyone to relate to their own history differently. It's more about how th this happens spontaneously. It doesn't happen by, um, by, by design, um, nor is it a recipe. And definitely this book is not a manual. It's not a how-to. Um, but I am saying that, let's say, let, let's take a, a slightly different example, which connects to what we're saying. We know, for, for instance, that people who have been raped may end up engaging sexually with a lot of rape fantasies. So from a traumatophobic perspective, this is just a repetition of something difficult that has happened. Uh, that the person could just not let go of, or they are so uh, fixated on the on the site of the trauma that they keep returning to it in ways that most analysts would say are perhaps not good for them, or kind of like the more kind of like kind of like those who might be a little bit more positive about it might say more open to these kinds of experiences might say, oh, but at least it happens under their control and under circumstances that are willed by them. So therefore, there's something reparative about the fact that now they have some mastery over it as opposed to the original condition where it happened against their consent. Mm. But what I'm trying to, what I'm saying is that, what I would say is that both of these approaches are traumatophobic. Why? Because they're both interested in the notion of, they both treat the affinity to the original trauma as, as a problem. In the first case, it's not solved. In the second case, it's solved. Repetition, compulsion, ostensibly will help you master it, or, or at least that's the idea. Uh, part of what I'm saying is, what if um, kind of like these kinds of experiences then become a medium through which subjects try to touch like the intensities of a sexual drive and of their own opacity, not, not through the trauma, but by means of the trauma, so that the trauma becomes a path mm -hmm. through which those kinds of contacts with the energetic search yeah. the enigma can come about. And that may also help us understand why those people who are attracted to the trauma to this way, yeah. and I have an example of slave play, of race play in the book, and of, um, uh, kind of like I work also a lot with a play called Slave Play and the film, The Night Porter. Both are examples of kind of like a very traumatophilic art where the yeah. visitation of the trauma in the domain of the erotic becomes not something to resolve, but the site of experience, of enlarged experience. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I know you just said it's it's not a manual, but uh, nevertheless, when I was reading it, you know, I also have a, one of uh, my friends uh, has a strong tendency to, I'd say, revisit um, past traumatic experiences again and again. Um, and your, the terms help help me to think about this because, you know, I suppose uh, if you just have the traumatophilic approach, sorry, the traumatophobic approach, then there's this agony about how to solve it. Can it be cured? What if it can't be? But when you introduce the two terms together, it's possible to think about this revisiting process maybe more differently and more like, mm -hmm. um, as yes, as you say, part of the subject's experience of, of their own subjectivity and so on. And, not, and it doesn't necessarily, it's therefore not like necessarily negatively inflected and traumatic to revisit um, yeah. which I think could be really useful I mean I certainly think it could be useful even if you don't intend it to be a kind of manual um, for, for, for conceptualizing how and why we kind of do these kind of looping returns to 
to our traumas or whatever. Um, I mean, here's, here's the trick. The, the, the difficult thing about this idea is that, you know, when I say that it's not a how-to, I'm not just kind of, it, I don't just have this allergic reaction to like a utilitarian project, uh, which, which can then take them back into kind of like, um, which can then take these ideas and plug them back into the capitalist production or neoliberalization of psychoanalysis, which I think is a yes. big problem. Um, but I also am very serious about the following. This kinds of um, brushing up against trauma with these kinds of energetic intensities around the side of something that has wounded us are not without risks. So it, it would be not inaccurate, but but also not and the whole story to say that this is a more positive relationship to trauma because, and this is also something that I emphasize quite a, a bit on the book, it's, it's actually in the, in the title of the book, there's, there's a lot of risk in engaging this way um, because you don't know when you are, this is why it can't be a project, when you are, when something opens up before you of that level of energetic intensity and when you are in what I describe as before, kind of like as as much as is uh, to the when you are. I'm sorry, I'm going to say this differently. These states bring you up against an un, as uncoated version of the sexual drive as there can ever be, mm -hmm. and these energies can go in very destructive directions. I mean that I think that's why people are both attracted to trauma and, and afraid of trauma because they sense, rightly so that you know this is where kind of like psychotic breakdowns may happen this is where somebody could get re-traumatized so my argument is not to say let's jettison traumatophobia and go for traumatophilia it's to open up space to imagine that there are other possibilities of engaging with trauma that while entailing risk can also open up to transformational experience and transformational experience as opposed to safety is another big kind of like um, counter in the book to the ways in which traumatophobia and many ways of practicing psychoanalysis these days and many ways of thinking about psychoanalysis are oriented towards keeping us safe, which I also speak about how that can impoverish us in experience. Yeah, no, I think that's a, a, a very clear and, and excellent way of putting it. I mean, before we run out of time, I want to ask one more. I want to ask one more um, question about the question of race. You just approached. You know, we covered the the three, the two parts of the subheadings. You know, traumatophilia and risk, and, and and to a lesser extent, race. But um, uh, so I want to ask you about that. But I also want you to say a little bit more about what you just said about the liberalization, neoliberalization, and capitalization of. Of therapy and so on in our culture because I think that is something that our listeners in particular which kind of come from a mixture of psychoanalysis and Marxist backgrounds will be really really interested in as mm -hmm. so I don't know if they're, they're two they're, they're I think two separate questions but you know uh, you you touched upon this question of of, of race and uh, you well I mean I was trying to work out what what your argument has been but you know um maybe we, maybe I can go back to what I thought you were saying earlier that is is it that this traumatophobic healing thing mm -hmm. uh, has a kind of parallel with the way in which a colonial project might work, right? So like purging out the trauma of others, and this is the privileged position of the, is that, is, am I on the right sort of track? Yeah. Mm -hmm. things to absolutely, absolutely. And this, um, this idea that, that we know better than the other, um, and I don't just mean the racial other, I mean the otherness also in ourselves, that we know better as to what needs to happen, kind of like this, this is what can plug the plug psychoanalysis into capitalism. Um, and especially now where, at least in the States, psychoanalysis is really grappling to figure out how to engage with race. Um, like the, the, the way the, those who speak about race in terms of like, and kind of like dignity and rights um, and have been writing in that domain, kind of like have an enlarged, audience at the moment. And I, I hope that that remains to be the case because certainly psychoanalysis has been wide, not just in its composition, but also more problematically so in its thinking. But, but here's what I'm also saying about race, which is also at the core of this book. Um, we were talking earlier about kind of like what the infant makes of this enigmatic piercing and how he's then drawn to translate and make code with meaning. So part of what Laplanche says is that 
there's a question of like, so how does the infant code with meaning? And Laplanche will say, well, the infant borrows codes that are circulating in the mythosymbolic world. Uh, there are, th these codes are made available to the infant through the parent, through the embodied relation, through words. Um, and those codes are kind of like basically what you would expect. They're the ways the cultural world is ordered. So he, he has a very explicit theorizing of how gender, how we become gendered through these codes. Um, and he hints at, but doesn't go in much depth into how kind of like religion and ethnic identity may also have to do with translation. And in this book, I take this to race and talk about how kind of like if race becomes a code with which to translate, what race also has in it is racism. There, there is no race without racism, right? So kind of like the, the, the very raw materials on which we rely to translate ourselves and also make, um, create our own experience of race. And I say create, which sounds very conscious. And of course, this is not intentional. Um, it happens as a result of the ego trying to form itself. Race becomes one way in which we understand ourselves. And, and here's the intervention around race. Race and thus racism, therefore, are also are, are part uh, of how the ego comes about. They are, they reside in what holds us together and what makes us feel at home in ourselves. So rather than all of these conversations that are happening right now about racism being unconscious or unconscious bias or kind of like becoming aware of our racism, I make an argument that actually things are much more dire and serious than that, which is we're not going to become aware of anything. We have libidinal investments in our racial categories, in our privilege, and racism. Racism is not an intellectual matter. It's not a cognitive affair. It is very much a libidinal affair. Therefore, the book is also very preoccupied with the erotics of racism, precisely for that reason. So paradoxically, and this goes back to the question of trauma, where traumatophobia tries to conserve the ego and repair it, Traumatophilia is also about squandering it and breaking it down, which is also what makes it potentially transformational and potentially dangerous. But I argue there's nothing less than a breakdown of the ego and a state of overwhelm that I theorize in great length in the book that is required for us to become transformed. So working on some of these issues is not just on the level of attending trainings or kind of like trying to find the racism in you. It's also about risking yourself and risking your very understanding of yourself. And that does not happen uh, by design. It happens by allowing yourself to bend your will and go to places that, that may scare you. Um, yeah. Is this touching on some of the questions we were asking? No, about? Absolutely. And I mean, of course, people, we, co we can't, can't cover this uh, huge, huge sprawling, I mean, series of topics that you deal with in the book I think you've really really introduced them and, and the importance of it and, and perhaps it is uh, appropriate to, to say that you know here you're also thinking of then how psychoanalysis can be the ally of a progressive racial politics or whatever mm -hmm. and uh, and as you just mentioned also how it can resist the kind of capitalization and uh, yeah. liberalization of, of of the situation that we're in today so you know maybe just as a, a way of finishing you know you you do see if I'm right, you, you do see psychoanalysis as being something that can be an important kind of ally of progressive politics against, say, capitalism or, um, you know, reactionary race politics that we're dealing with. And, and, and yeah. you are the ways in which it can av can avoid, can help, can help those progressive causes. Would that be right to, to say? Yeah, I think I'm always cautious when I when we're talking about progressive causes, because causes also come with party lines and they also come with strategies. And I think, you know, in, in many ways, like another way to describe the book is that it's, it's very much organized around the particular rather than the universal and causes kind of like are trying to graft new universals out of larger universals. Um, so in, in, in many ways, my emphasis is on what it means to move away from identity and what it is to move away from the way that we're told we're expected to relate to each other, even by progressive politics, and dare into territories that frighten us, which is where I think possibilities for overwhelm reside. Yeah.
Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, great. No, I think that's a great answer. And and it's a really um, fascinating book. I mean, we've talked about a lot there. We've talked about race and uh, aversion and sexuality and infantile sexuality and trauma and traumatophilia, as you put it. Uh, and so, you know, and there's there's all that and, and loads more in the book that uh, I really recommend people to read. As I said before, it's um, called Sexuality Beyond Consent. Or maybe I can just ask you what you had in mind with the title. Oh, sure. Um, So we talked about risk, race, traumatophilia. Um, Now that I can, it's much easier to explain this after we've had this conversation, like none of this will happen with your consent. None of this will happen with the ego's consent. And, you know, we were talking earlier about how some of these possibilities can only be available to somebody through the bending of their will. But that doesn't happen. That's why I was kind of like, I kept saying, like, this is not about willfulness and it's not about a project. This is about what happens at the limit of your consent and something that you might have not agreed to, just like the stranger in the, on, the, on the sling and with the abject, disgusting lover that you were bringing up at the beginning. It, it would be, he did not rape him, but he also did not consent to what happened. Kind of like, and this is where... Um, consent and our kind of like fixation on affirmative consent, which I would say is very traumatophobic, um, kind of like falls short because transformational experiences do not happen with our consent. They happen, they, they come to us unbidden and only when we risk ourselves. Yeah. No, fantastic. And I I, absol- I find it extremely compelling and I agree we need to think about sexuality beyond consent. And I really recommend people to read this fantastic new book just out. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us and, yeah. and talking about us. It's been fascinating and I, I really enjoyed the book and recommend it to everyone. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Like really fantastic questions. I, I had a lot of fun talking about this with you.